Hello again. I'm back after three months or so of sabbatical, and here's a, here's one of the videos again. I'm only going to be doing this for a few weeks because actually I'm only back on duty for four weeks and then we're packing up here and moving to a new appointment and that, that's going to take a few weeks to sort out over the summer. Anyway, lectionary gospel for today is in Matthew chapter 10 verses 24 to 39. It's some words of Jesus and in some of the other Gospels these sayings are split about in different places but Matthew puts all of these together and I think it's because he's got a, a theme going here about discipleship. Jesus said the student is not above the teacher nor a servant above his master it's enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them, for there's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. When I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So, in a webinar I was on during the sabbatical, a very wise Christian leader said something like this, if you want to grow the church, don't concentrate on church attendance. Does that shock you? Don't we want to grow numbers at church? Well, let me give you a fuller version of the quote. It went something more like this. If you want to grow the church, concentrate on engagement, not attendance. And the point is this, anyone can attend church and that's fine, all are welcome, but that doesn't make them a Christian. What Jesus said about being a Christian was, follow me. That's rather more than attendance. We don't merely seek more attendees or more church members welcome as they are we seek more disciples of Jesus 
people who will engage with him. So it's fitting that in today's passage, Jesus concentrates on discipleship. If we listen to him, we'll know more of what we're called to and what we call others to, the engagement with Jesus. Firstly, discipleship is essentially imitation. Imitation. It's enough for students to be like their masters and servants, students to be like their teachers, I mean, and servants like their masters, says Jesus. Now, I hear those words and what comes into my mind, but the, the old tune from Disney's Jungle Book, Ooby Doo, I want to be like you. Well, maybe I've left you with an earworm, I don't know. But I want to be like you is the essence of what we say to Jesus. In the culture of Jesus' day, disciples were the students who learned from their teachers, but it wasn't classroom knowledge. It was the kind of learning where they learned from their masters, the rabbis, how to live. And they learned how to live by imitating their teachers. Some disciples of rabbis took that to incredible extremes. And in case any of you are of delicate sensibilities, I'm not going to give you some of the most graphic examples that I could do from the history books. But the basic point was that a disciple wanted to learn how to live the godly life by imitating his rabbi. And the Christian tradition took this up. Not only did disciples follow Jesus, the apostle Paul urged converts to follow him in so far as he followed Jesus. And you move along the centuries, get to the late medieval period, and a Dutch-German Christian called Thomas Kempis published a book which is one of the great Christian classics of all time. The book is called The Imitation of Christ. And that's our priority more people looking more like Jesus. We need to organize our priorities and our practices in the church around that goal. It means, for example, that our small groups at the Bible studies are not just ones where we sit together for an evening drinking coffee and say, learn something and say, oh, that's interesting, and then close the Bible and go home. Rather, they are groups that look at how we're going to put into practice the teaching of Jesus, and next week we meet and find out how each other's been getting on with it. Yeah, we're all going to fail along the way in imitating Jesus, but Jesus has already provided for that with forgiveness through the cross. And because of that, yes, we fail, but we confess and we get up and we dust ourselves down again and we go again. And so that's why it's not enough for us to say that the gospel is inclusive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we rightly say God loves everyone. Yes, we will rightly want to welcome all and sundry to church. But it cannot just stop at all our welcome. Because the point of all our welcome is to bring people to the point of hearing Jesus say, Follow me. You're welcome as you are. But Jesus calls us all to change and to be like him. Now, the church doesn't have a good reputation I think in society these days but there are still many who have a warm regard for Jesus and what we can say to people is come along taste and see have a look at what it means 
to follow Jesus and be more like him. And with that invitation to engagement, we can begin to grow the church. Secondly, discipleship is rooted in God's love. Yes, Jesus was loved, but not by all. The Gospels say that the common people heard him gladly, but we know that the powerful people generally didn't. And it earned him conflict, suffering, and eventually death. If we are going to imitate Jesus, and even, then even without being unduly provocative, there are times when it will earn us opposition and pain. And when bad times dominate, we may be tempted to despair. Is it worth it if the, the bad people always come out on top? So, Jesus tells his disciples not to worry. God will expose the deeds of the wicked to the light. That's why he tells his followers not to be afraid of those who can kill the body but not the soul. Sure, there is a proper holy fear of God, as Jesus says, but at the root of it all is a God who loves us so much more than anything else in all creation, sparrows included. We have a value to our Heavenly Father, he says. And so just as Jesus' own security was in the Father's love for him, our security as disciples is in the Father's love for us because there can be plenty of things to discourage us as Christian disciples. We are a minority. We are misunderstood. People reject us. Even family members take issue with us. It isn't unusual for us to go through phases in life where we feel there isn't much hope for all that is good, beautiful and right in the kingdom of God. Wouldn't it be so much easier to chuck it all in and go along with the majority? And it's to that experience that Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I wonder if anyone watching is in a situation of discouragement or even despair about their life of faith. If you are, then, then Jesus says to you that his Father's love for you has not diminished. You are so valuable in his sight. After all, he made you in his own image. He knows you so well that he can count the hairs of your head, even if in the case of most of us men, that gets easier for him as we get older. You are loved. You are loved with the everlasting love of heaven. Whenever bad things happen to you, in this life because you follow Jesus nothing changes the fact that your heavenly father loves you and that he will do justice in his time remember for the Christian if the end is bad it's not really the end third and finally discipleship is our priority and here I'm referring to what Jesus says in those difficult words about not bringing peace but a sword, how family members will be divided against each other, how we must choose following him above even loving our families. And this might get us worried. Is Jesus telling us to neglect our families? Well, no, he isn't. But he is telling us that because he is Lord, our allegiance to him must come above all other things in life, even above our families, however important they are. And when we commit to Jesus Christ, 
we're not just joining a social club we're not taking on a new leisure interest we're not joining the new branch of pure gym that has just opened in the village of the church where I preached this sermon we are reshaping our entire lives around Jesus and of course in doing that and committing to that many of us know the pain of divided families where some of us are committed to Jesus Christ and other family members are not and Jesus reminds us not to compromise our own commitment to him in order to appease our loved ones and by implication he also is calling us not to make excuses for them who do not follow him wishful thinking about their eternal destiny is precisely that wishful thinking God doesn't suddenly lower the bar for some people just because they're related to us well that's all rather severe so what should we do then when we are faced with division in our families around Christ or perhaps our friends as well we know Jesus doesn't want to back down on our commitment we know also from other places that he doesn't want us to be harsh and judgmental and superior how do we handle this well I believe that the key to this is that it should drive us to regular sustained and committed prayer let's pray regularly for our loved ones who don't follow Jesus if we can let's pray every day for them prayer is what moves spiritual mountains prayer removes obstacles it removes blockages in people's lives you know the, the evangelist D.L. Moody who was around sort of the turn of the last not the century that started 20 odd years ago but the previous one he kept a list of a hundred friends who hadn't followed Christ and he prayed for them and in his lifetime 96 of those hundred committed themselves to Christ what about the other four they committed themselves to Christ at Moody's funeral so let's keep up the praying let's not give up let's not compromise because we'll be surprised what God can do in the long term let our tears for our loved ones move us to our knees you know it may seem a paradox but having begun with talking about growing the church what Jesus is saying to us here is that the way to grow the church is not to lower the bar but to raise the bar it's not by making entry easy but being frank about what a challenge it is to follow Jesus I wonder are we ready to embrace that for ourselves and are we ready to take that to the world okay that's it for this week over the next few weeks my sermons will probably I think depart from the lectionary because I'm preaching farewell services next week at my Byfleet church the following week at my Knapp Hill church and the week after that for my Methodist circuit but I hope what I share will have relevance beyond our local situation and I hope you'll be able to join me. God bless you all. Bye-bye.